KPFB in Berkeley and 88.1 KFCF in Fresno and online and archived at www.kpfa.org. It's 1 o'clock. It's time for Guns and Butter with Bonnie Faulkner, followed at 2 by Bay Native Circle, 3 o'clock, Jack Foley in Cover to Cover, 3.30, Free Speech Radio News, 4 o'clock, Hard Knock Radio, 5 flashpoints and after the evening news at 7 p.m voices of the middle east and north africa this is guns and butter basically the idea is that you produce constant growth it's, it's a constant kind of ramping up. And then interesting things happen when that becomes impossible for physical reasons because of, you know, the wearing out of the natural environment that uh, uh, all of the wealth, in fact, actually comes from. And um, I think the workout is, in terms of the politics is, is uh, almost the same. Everybody starts stealing. Everybody realizes that this can't go on. And so everybody tries to walk away with a piece. So that was happening in the Soviet Union, and that is happening in the United States now. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. Today on Guns and Butter, Dmitry Orlov. Today's show, The Collapse Gap. Dmitry Orlov was born and grew up in Leningrad, but has lived in the United States since the mid-70s. He was an eyewitness to the Soviet collapse over several extended visits to his Russian homeland between the late 80s and mid-90s. He is the author of Reinventing Collapse, The Soviet Example and American Prospects, which examines the circumstances of the collapse of the former Soviet Union and draws parallels between the two superpowers in how the two cultures might deal with such massive change. Today we discuss his observations and on-the-ground experiences during the fall of the Soviet Union and compare the Soviet situation with that of the rapid changes taking place in the United States today. Dmitry Orlov, welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you. Your book, Reinventing Collapse, The Soviet Example and American Prospects, describes the collapse of the Soviet system and what the Soviet experience can teach us about a coming collapse of the United States. You grew up in the Soviet Union, emigrated to the United States when you were 12, and then you took extended visits to the Soviet Union beginning in 1989. Your on-the-ground eyewitness report is quite unique. What did you find on your first trip back? Well, when I got back there the first time, uh, it was still very much the Soviet Union, very recognizable the way I remembered it from uh, having grown up there and gone to school there. Um, there were communist slogans in all the buildings, and there were uh, streets uh, with a lot of traffic made up of uh, Ladas and Volgas, old, old Soviet cars. Um, there were a lot of lines in the shops. The people were still standing in line, queuing to buy stuff. Um, the politics was interesting because there was a lot more conversation and a lot more things could be said that couldn't be said before. Uh, but there was really nothing happening politically. Uh, it was really the old system that was still you know, very much running, and nobody would imagine that it would collapse about a year and a half, two years later. Uh, at that point, you couldn't say that to anyone and, and you know, get, get anything but a, just a completely, you know, dumbfounded stare in return. It was just an unthinkable thing. And people were talking about little bits of reform, like there was a cooperative movement that was um, basically trying to make pseudo-free market enterprises function alongside the state enterprises. But um, that was about all that was going on, really. Now, when you say that no one there would have been thinking about a coming collapse within the next year and a half, two years, was that something that had occurred to you then or not? Not really. Uh, at that point, I was thinking, just like everyone else, that Gorbachev is basically um, a swing of the pendulum in a liberal direction, that um, this would 
go on for a little while. Maybe Gorbachev would try some reforms. Maybe he would uh, make some things better. Certainly, a lot of people were enjoying the fact that for the first time they could publish, that political prisoners were released from prison, from camps, labor camps, like my uncle, for instance. All of those things were, you know, seen as, as positives, definitely. But nobody thought that, you know, the beast was going to change its spots. That, that this was, you know, a brand new beginning of any sort. And certainly nobody thought that, uh, you know, the Soviet Union would cease to exist any time during the next several centuries. And I just want to mention here that uh, you're living on a boat, and that's why we're hearing uh, water in the background. That's right, and, and mercifully there are no power boats circling around, so that we aren't hearing engine noises, which is a good thing. Well, Dimitri, then, your second visit to the Soviet Union after your visit in 1989 was when, in 1992? No, I, I went back just a year later, in 1990, and I was back there again for an entire summer, and that's when I basically noticed that it was all changed, it was all different, um, because... The shops were closed, the traffic was gone, the smog was gone because the factories shut down. St. Petersburg, Leningrad is, or was ringed by a lot of factories that produced a lot of the war material, weapons, etc., for the Soviet military. And there were always belching smoke. There were smokestacks. It was all ran on coal. And so when that was gone, that, that was very visible. You know, you could just, for the first time, you could see the blue sky over the city. Um, and uh, also, it was, it was deserted because everybody, it seemed, who could, was out in the countryside trying to grow food, grow or gather or hunt food because there was just no food to be found. And at, at certain points, you know, I, I had places to go, people to see, and, and uh, I was actually starving um, because... You couldn't buy food. It was impossible. And I survived. The whole family survived on some rice that we brought with us and, and some fish that a neighbor caught in a nearby lake. And uh, once in a while I would run across somebody who would have a larder, a stockpile, and, and uh, get fed. But it was very precarious. And, and clearly this was just a completely different reality that, that, that took hold, and it took less than a year. Now, how long was this visit of yours in 1990? It was about a month. I think it was five weeks or so. I see. Then you returned again in what year? Uh, a couple of years later, I went there in the dead of winter. And that was a, an eye-opening experience as well, because that was uh, in the midst of absolute dire uh, political and economic collapse. That, that was during the, you know, basically the early part of the dissolution of the Soviet Union, where certain, certain republics had already gone their separate ways and certain others. Uh, I, I visited Belarus in particular. People there were rather upset that the Soviet Union fell apart because they were very loyal subjects. And uh, the people that I talked to there just couldn't believe that Moscow would just, like, not answer the phone anymore. And, and they didn't know what to do. Uh, and then I, I, I witnessed scenes of absolute, you know, social collapse and devastation in Russia where you had middle class people digging around in, in the garbage and, and, you know, flea markets where you could just buy, you know, children's toys or, you know, that were obviously taken away from the children so that the family could eat something and things like that. Um, also, it was very clear to me that, you know, there was massive economic dislocation on the financial level because I brought in, uh, I came in with a lot of $1 bills, American $1 bills, because somebody told me that that's the thing to do, so I, I, I took a stack of them. And um, it turns out that each one of those was uh, 1,000 rubles, and the average salary at the time was only a few hundred rubles. So I was handing out uh, three times somebody's monthly salary, just sort of as a piece of paper. It's like, here, have a piece of paper. Send it right away. So... That, that was uh, that was probably the worst that I'd seen on on subsequent visits. Uh, it was clear that you know there was already a new economy taking hold, and you know there were bouts of hyperinflation, but people learned to cope with it. And there was a default that happened in the in the late 90s, and people were very much prepared for it because they cashed out of the ruble and and bought dollars ahead of time. Uh, so people learned how to navigate this this new terrain. But uh, during the early 90s, it was just absolute dislocation and uh, quite, quite, quite a horrible scene.
In your book, you describe the problems that ensued from the collapse of the Soviet Union as largely organizational rather than physical in nature. What do you mean? Basically, the Soviet Union was a system that was run from a center at the center's financial laws. This is vaguely similar to what's, what's happening in the United States, where the, the federal government is assuming all the debt. And, and so uh, when the Soviet Union could no longer run any sort of a trade surplus and became, became dependent on, on various types of imports um, and uh, then... Uh, couldn't export its way out of this predicament by producing more oil because uh, the oil provinces that had developed were peaking and at the same time oil, oil prices on the world market were low. You know, that was kind of a perfect storm and, and the Soviet Union could no longer take on debt. Foreign creditors would start walking and walking away, etc. And that made it very difficult for Moscow to send money to the provinces, to the republics, uh, to support the, uh, the, the Soviet-style experiments in Eastern Europe, etc., which were eating up a lot of resources. And, and that made the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and, and the Warsaw Pact inevitable for more or less financial reasons. So that was a, you know, a political problem. But at the same time, there was a um, an industrial complex and, and an, an extractive industry for coal and natural gas and oil that basically ran in a command and control uh, system that was not dependent on market prices. It was not dependent on, on any sort of a free market system or ideology. So there was no gouging. Uh, there was no hoarding. Uh, and stuff was just dug up and delivered and burnt and processed. And, and that system just continued to run not very well. It never ran particularly well. It was never very efficient. But it just continued to run in spite of all the other things that, that fell apart all around it. You described the pre-perestroika stagnation period in Russia as a chronic underperformance of the economy coupled with record levels of military expenditures, trade deficit, and foreign debt so that it became difficult for the average Russian middle-class family of three with both parents working to make ends meet. So that sounds a little bit like what's happening here in the United States right now. Yes, the drivers, the way they made the numbers work was different because in the Soviet Union was basically a company run by engineers um, more than lawyers. And so they, they basically looked at physical factors and uh, they structured uh, economic growth in terms of five-year plans that uh, basically made it uh, mandatory to hit certain production targets in terms of tons of this and that produced and, uh, you know, number of machine tools delivered on schedule and things like that. And, and they, they ran the economy from the point of view of what does it take not in terms of, you know, what is it supposed to deliver in terms of financial results. Here it's very much divorced from the, the physical basis of it, and it's, it's run by lawyers and money men more than anything else. But basically the idea is that you, you produce constant growth. It's, it's a constant kind of ramping up. And then interesting things happen when that becomes impossible for physical reasons because of, you know, the wearing out of the natural environment that, uh, you know, uh, all of the wealth, in fact, actually comes from. And um, I think the workout is, in terms of the politics is, is uh, almost the same. Everybody starts stealing. Everybody realizes that this can't go on. And so everybody tries to walk away with a piece. So that was happening in the Soviet Union, and that is happening in the United States now. Boy, that's for sure. Uh, you also say that there's a lesson to be learned from the Russian experience of a collapsing economy, that one should stop thinking of wealth in terms of money, access to physical resources and assets, as well as intangibles, such as connections and relationships, quickly becomes much more valuable than mere cash. Um, yes, and I think that that's a very important point to, to absorb. I think in the United States, probably more than in a lot of other places, just because of, of the history of the place, uh, people think of wealth and of value in terms of money. And, and how something is valued and how much it costs, those things are confused. And, and there's no distinction made between how something is valued 
and how valuable it is. That is how useful it is directly to you or to someone else. So there's a lot of confusion uh, on that score. And also, uh, people don't really understand the fact that money decays. You know, it's supposed to be this immutable substance. It's numbers on a piece of paper, and the numbers are sacred, and they never change. But, in fact, money decays, you know, in one of two ways. One is financial failure of your investments, and the other one is failure of the currency itself through inflation. So it decays over time. And if the real economy starts decaying fast, as it is now, you know, it's just all rusting away, then the money that's supposed to represent the value within that economy also decays relatively fast. And people try to paper it over by borrowing from the future, and eventually nobody will give them credit for it, and the whole thing caves in on itself. So what do you do in the meantime? How do you actually find what it takes for you to, to provide for yourself? Well, it turns out that you don't look at money. You don't look at, at markets. You don't look at commercial arrangements, you look at things that are actually there that you can directly use, that you can directly trade for other useful things with other people, and, and that you can structure a life out of in absence of a functioning economy. And this is the challenge that we have before us. I'm speaking with author and engineer Dmitry Orlov. Today's show, The Collapse Gap. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. You write that the Russian system could not be reformed. Instead of adapting, it fell apart. How well do you feel that the United States can adapt to a collapsing economy? Oh, not at all. Absolutely not. I mean, first of all, we can't even say the word collapse. Basically, if this is a recession, growth will resume, and um, everybody is very much brainwashed by this free market ideology that left to its own devices, the economy will just spontaneously recover. And that, that is the mindset here. So um, if you want to talk about reform, you have to figure out what it is to reform and why it needs to be reform. And since we can't have that conversation, there's no point in talking about reform. What is the stunning failure of the collective imagination that you address in your book, Reinventing Collapse? Well, I, I think that collapse is staring us in the face. We can see it every day, but we're just not allowed to see it. We're basically, when we bring it up, we are panned, we are ignored. We're told that, you know, this is, this is defeatist, this is uh, unpatriotic, and that we should stop talking about it uh, and, you know, do something useful. It doesn't matter whether there's anything useful to be done or not. It's, it's the do something syndrome. Something must be done. And so there, there's this complete inability to see not very far into the future and to develop the skills and the adaptations and, and put things together uh, socially, individually, etc., that would make the future survivable for more people and, and better in every way. Um, so this is really what, what, I, what I try to do is just wake people up a little bit, explain to them that there's a perfectly good reason why nobody talks about it. You know, it may be a valid reason. It's just not very valid for them personally because it, it won't work out for them very well if, if they keep with this, this program, that they have to come up with a program of their own. What happens when a modern economy collapses and the complex society it supports disintegrates? I think the best way to look at it is as a life support system um, and, and uh, how resilient is it in, in the face of, of disruption. So uh, if, if you look at the things that could very easily be disrupted, such as, you know, money coming out of ATM machines and, you know, um, credit being, being advanced when you uh, um, swipe a credit card through a slot, things like that, and how many, how many things are driven from that, or gasoline deliveries to various locations and how, uh, how many people become stranded when those fail, you know, things like that. Uh, but th there are so many interconnections within, within a modern industrial economy that uh, it's just not very resilient. And, and there are a lot of knock-on effects that can occur quite easily. And the end result is that, you know, their electricity goes out, people are stranded, they don't have access to, to, to food. Uh, next, you know, pumped water stops stops working, or, or the sewage sewage systems flood. Um, you know, really basic things like that that are just unreliable in the face of collapse. Uh, you can you can look at 
the physics of a system, and uh, you can say that, well, okay, here's a system that's designed for steady state, and it it can go on in absence of other working systems. You know, a good example is, you know, Roman aqueducts. Uh, or here's a system that relies on, on diesel fuel being delivered to, to pumping stations, and uh, so it won't work unless the diesel is delivered. So why would... Why would the diesel continue to be delivered? Um, and and I would say that, you know, looking, I'm an engineer, looking at, at all the systems that we have here in the United States, they're so intertwined and they're so fragile that the chance of it all holding together is nil. You say that economic collapse gives rise to newer, smaller, poorer economies. How so? Well, when people lose access to, to imports, um, and to products brought in from far away, um, they they have to uh, come up with with stopgap solutions based on um, resources they have on hand, things they can reuse and recycle, the skills that they have within the community, um, and and basically everyone just scales down to a point where. Um, they, they can continue to survive on some level. Uh, of course, uh, initially there's there's a lot of you know unpleasantness because people are you know used to having on demand hot water. And if it turns out that you you collect rainwater and then you you collect some firewood and you boil a kettle and that's how you wash, then a lot of people are upset by that. But eventually they adjust. So that that's the sort of adaptation that I'm talking about. Well, maybe in that vein, uh, you should talk uh, for a minute about why the United States wouldn't be uh, importing so much stuff. Now, you're implying that imports are going to end. Why would that be? There are a few different ways to look at it. Uh, one is um, that the exporting countries are not particularly interested in, in exporting oil to the United States because, you know, the United States is very wedded to this idea of a free market. That's not really very good if you're an oil exporter. If you're an oil exporter, you have a certain patrimony of, of stuff in the ground. You want to stretch it out and you want to you want to use it for the greatest benefit. You don't want to turn it over to a free market system because uh, then it, it allows other people to make money and, and cuts you out as much as possible. So um, what oil producers and, and natural gas producers, etc., try to do now is uh, lock their customers into a long-term contract. Uh, so China, for instance, is very amenable to that sort of arrangement, uh, to signing long-term deals, and they're, they're doing it with, with uh, Venezuela and with Russia, etc. But Americans are left out. Um, another problem is that... Uh, if, if you're a, an, an energy exporter, there are two things you can do. You can export that energy as a raw material, in which case you're, you're just a, you know, a country that exports, exports useful things and imports U.S. dollars, which are not very useful. Or you can use that energy to grow and stimulate your domestic economy, driving down unemployment, uh, diversifying your economy, etc., in which case you will have less energy to export. This is known as the export land effect. So we, we know that, for instance, oil production is poised to decline, but the ex oil exports, that is the, the amount of oil av available on the free market, will not just decline, it will drop to zero. And, and so countries like the United States that uh, uh, have to import over 60% of the oil uh, will literally be left out in the cold. So... Um, this, this is basically the, 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 the biggest problem facing the United States, I think, is how to live without cars, how to live without most of the transportation fuel that we're used to having. And nobody's really talking about it. You say in your book that free market fundamentalism has prevented the United States from entering into these long-term energy agreements with energy producers. So we don't have long-term energy agreements? Well, not really, and it's, it's not even just the United States. It's uh, the English-speaking world. This has been labeled as the Anglo disease by some, some Europeans. The, the inability to see past the failings of the free market system and understand that other countries are not very interested in it and would rather have a long-term barter arrangement, you know, based on, on physical flows of, of things that they know they will need moving forward things like oil, things like rice, you know, um, commodities. And, and uh, 
So uh, there's a, a failure to think in those terms, and it's, it's not like, oh, we'll think differently today. It, there's a set of skills that have to do with successfully negotiating international barter arrangements. I think the Russians, of all people, are, are pretty far on, on the learning curve there because of the experience they've gone through where there were a lot of barter relationships because the financial system wasn't working. So uh, they're, they're better at it than, than most people right now. Uh, Americans are just nowhere on a map as far as figuring that out. Now, did I understand you correctly? Did you say that in the future there would be no more oil available to import because it would all be spoken for? Exactly. It would all be locked into uh, various long-term arrangements with various types of security guarantees added. Um, barter arrangements, you know, we give you oil, you give us food, that sort of thing. Because everybody wants to eat, no matter how much the oil is worth or how much of it there is. Um, and and so um, that that is the, the sort of thing that will dominate. Now, right now, uh, China has uh, the ability to, to uh, basically uh, use its phenomenal reserve of, of U.S. dollars to to pay for arrangements like this, you know, to, to basically buy resources and, you know, lock them down. So it, it's, it's quite conceivable that the United States is really going to be locked out of the whole process. What was the Brezhnev Doctrine and what is the Carter Doctrine? The Brezhnev Doctrine is basically the idea that once a country undergoes the revolutionary process and becomes a socialist country on its way to becoming a communist country, there is no going back. In the early years of, of the revolution, there was a lot of counter-revolutionary activity. It was crushed, hence the success of the Soviet Union, and, and hence any time any other country goes through the same process, the Soviet Union, as the bulwark of communism, has to make sure that you know there is no backsliding into barbaric capitalism. So the Brezhnev Doctrine was disastrously applied in Afghanistan, where Afghanistan is not is not capitalist and it's not socialist. It's tribal, and always will be. And so the idea that you had the superficial change in, in Kabul uh, in the direction of socialism and then it it being reversed was such a horrible thing in the scheme of things that that was faulty thinking but the result of it was this absolutely intractable conflict that went on for a long time that allowed uh, the United States to fund Osama bin Laden's organization and have a successful insurgency in, in Afghanistan eventually defeating the Russians causing them to retreat and the end of the Brezhnev doctrine really meant that the prestige of the communist experiment was was tarnished forever. So once they lost Afghanistan, they ended up losing uh, all of Eastern Europe and eventually even the Soviet Union and Russia itself. So that, that was the, basically the slide toward perdition for, for communists. Uh, the Carter Doctrine is something he came up with in response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which basically said that uh, the United States reserves the right to intervene militarily in the Middle East to secure oil supplies. So that had various uh, types of uh, disastrous effects later on, such as Gulf War One and, and, and Two. Gulf War One was something that left Iraq in limbo for a generation, and then Gulf War Two finished the job, destroying the country. But basically, I think it remains in effect, and the point is that there's absolutely no proof that it results in, in better access to oil. All of these military adventures in the Middle East uh, there is not one iota of evidence that they result in better oil prices, better terms for the United States, more availability of oil, or anything like that. I'm speaking with author and engineer Dmitry Orlov. Today's show, The Collapse Gap. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. You compare pre- and post-collapse conditions for the Soviet Union and the United States... Focusing on food, shelter, transportation, education, finances, and security. What about the comparison of food availability in each country? How did it go in Russia, and how do you see it unfolding here in the United States? Well, in Russia, there was a chronic underperformance of the agricultural sector. It, it was basically a political problem. It was the, the aftermath of, of collectivization, which destroyed uh, the entire farming class of the population in Russia. Before the revolution, uh, Russia was a grain exporter and provided grain to most of Western Europe. 
Um, and after the revolution, there were famines in, in the Ukraine, which is the most productive part, really, agriculturally. And uh, after that, the, the agricultural sector just never recovered, and that was what part of the reason that you know, the Soviet Union ended up in so much debt is that they had to import basic foodstuffs after a while. And they couldn't reform it because that would have meant saying that collectivization was a mistake and that was politically impossible. So um, that that doomed the, the attempts at reform there. Um, in the United States, we, we basically have an agro-industrial complex that, that uh, uses um, all sorts of very energy thirsty techniques a lot of fuel a lot of technology uh, gigantic combines and four-wheel drive tractors uh, with attachments etc um, a, a lot of uh, very tricky land management but it's, it's all very chemical intensive so there's a lot of fertilizer nitrogen fertilizer that goes into it a lot of it runs off because it isn't really fixed in the soil it's, the soil is spiked a lot of Pesticides, uh, a lot of hybrids are used, GM is used, uh, genetically modified stuff, even though there's no evidence that the yield improves as a result. So it, it's a, a very technologically advanced system, but that doesn't make it any less fragile, really. Um, politically, in the Soviet Union, um, food security was treated as something fairly important. In, in particular, uh, bread riots were more or less a fixture. The, Revolution, the October Revolution, uh, came came to pass partly because it was impossible to supply people with bread, and that became fixed in in the public consciousness as the sort of basic right that you have. And the, there was a re revolutionary slogan, "Bread to the people." Um, so the Soviets were not really in a position to go back on on, on that part of of the charter. Um, and so they always tried to supply people with food and also with some other basic foodstuffs. So there was there were food stockpiles everywhere. It was an inefficient system, but it it resulted in a, a very boring diet. But there was very little malnutrition and no starvation during the Soviet times. And then when the system fell apart, it fell apart slowly because there was a lot of institutionalized food. A lot of people ate at cafeterias where they worked, and and uh, there were a lot of local food stockpiles. Um, also, at the same time, because the food that you could officially buy in stores were so, was so bland and boring, uh, people tried to grow and gather a lot of their own food. And so when the supply lines in the, in, in the government stores dried up, people took to gardening very seriously. And that was really you know, a lifeline for a lot of families during the worst years. So in the United States, you have a, a just-in-time delivery to supermarkets. It takes, you know, two days' worth of disruption for, for the, the, uh, the shelves to be stripped of anything useful. And then after that, nothing happens until FEMA, you know, federal emergency, arrives and starts handing stuff out. So the problem there is that FEMA can't handle the whole country at once. It can handle New Orleans, maybe, you know, but it can't handle the entire country all at the same time. So there are limits to how resilient the American food delivery system is, uh, certainly less resilient than the Russian food delivery system, the Soviet turned out to be, and so people should plan accordingly. Now, what about the comparison between the former Soviet Union and the United States when it comes to shelter? Well, here, uh, shelter was treated more or less as a, a right of citizenship in the Soviet Union. So uh, people uh, had to wait in line to get an apartment of their own. Um, and before that, they usually ended up, you know, staying in a dormitory or with their parents or something like that. But once they got it, their address was uh, written indelibly in their internal passport, and the only way they could be dislodged is if they died. Um, so... Basically, this was more or less free living for life. And so you didn't need an economy to keep a roof over your head. Rents were nominal. There were no foreclosures. Uh, there were no evictions, uh, no mechanism for doing any of that. So people just generally went on living wherever they were. Uh, in the United States, it's, it's all much more precarious. And so you can lose your mortgage or your lease, and then that's it. You're out on the street. And then if you don't have a job, then there's no chance that you'll get another mortgage or another lease. And it just basically, it's like slipping on a banana peel, and, and that's it. You're done. So in, in that sense, Soviet society turned out to be very resilient because one of the things that determines whether society uh, stays together or falls apart is whether 
people end up homeless or not. So here we have a lot of homelessness, and right now it's hidden in all, all sorts of ways. People around here in Salem spending the entire summer at a campsite with their families because, you know, they have no place to live. Uh, they're thinking they might find something later on. Or people staying with their families or with their friends, you know, couch surfing, all sorts of arrangements like that that hide the true level of homelessness. But this is something that Americans will at some point have to address, the fact that the real estate is, is going to be parceled out in some way that is actually a little bit more equitable, that allows people to have a place to live regardless of their ability to pay. Because having them not have a place to live is a bigger cost to society than marshalling resources and making them available. And what about the comparison between the two countries when it comes to transportation? Well, again, in the Soviet Union, very few people had a personal automobile. It, it was sort of the, the ultimate vanity item. Some people would own cars. They would uh, spend most of the time locked in these little corrugated metal shack garages that dot at the outskirts of cities. And, and then they, they might do a road trip during the summer or, you know, a few holidays where they would actually drive them. And probably the most important things that the cars were used for was uh, driving to and from the country house uh, to get the seedlings out there and then to haul the, uh, the harvest back to the city in the form of preserves or stuff to put in a, in a root cellar. And so people didn't really depend on having access to private transportation. At the same time, there was a lot of public transportation. There were buses, trolley buses, trains, etc. And most of the built-up infrastructure in, in Russia was along trunk lines. It wasn't spread out. You know, there wasn't the suburban style of making subdivisions and connecting them with little roads. So everything was strung out along central arteries, and so it was quite accessible. So nobody really became stranded as a result of collapse. Uh, there, there were some disruptions in the transportation system. Uh, a lot of trains ended up running late, etc. I, I witnessed some of that. But people really didn't get stranded, none of them. And they always could afford to get around. So uh, in the United States, basically, as I like to put it, your car gets to eat first because if you don't feed your car gasoline, then you won't be able to get to where they hand out the food. So here, uh, a lot of people, once they lose the ability to drive, their ability to survive in general is, is damaged severely. And they basically become stranded in a place that wasn't set up for them to be able to live there without being able to, to drive back and forth. And it's a good question what happens then. I think a lot of these suburban properties are only accessible by private automobile will just be abandoned. You know, they'll just be ghost towns. Uh, but, again, this is something that people need to think about, how to survive without a car. I've been thinking about it for years. I haven't had a car for years. It's certainly possible. It does restrict your options to things that will continue to work moving forward, and that's not such a bad thing. There already are a lot of abandonments of uh, suburbia. I've been reading a lot of news stories about Florida where the housing developments, well, of course, that's due to foreclosure, not because somebody doesn't have a car, and then, of course, these developments are being stripped. So that's already beginning to happen. Well, people keep their cars even after they lose their houses. Uh, in, in the United States, the car is the more important possession, it turns out. Once you lose the car, then really you have nothing uh, in, in that landscape where, you know, you can't survive without a car. Um, I know there are some experiments in uh, Los Angeles, I believe, where people are allowed to live in their cars and their special parking lots for that. So eventually, maybe the shanty towns of America are just basically SUVs with people living in them, and the SUVs never move. In your chapter, Superpower Similarities, that is the similarities between the Soviet Union and the United States, you list six similarities, the space race, the arms race, the jails race, the evil empire race, the squandering of natural resources race, and the bankruptcy race. And I think some of these are, are pretty familiar, certainly the space race, the arms race, etc. What about the jails race? Oh, well, that's an interesting case. Uh, the, the Soviet government basically tried to cleanse society of uh, categories of people that it couldn't make use of in, in building the brave new world. So, um, obviously, gypsies, for instance, were in for it. Um, a lot of other undesirables, social undesirables. Certainly, um, nuns and priests fit into the category of people they, they, they had no use for. Uh, 
people who were politically active, but not in the in the sense that the communists had in mind. And and generally, a lot of people kind of got swept swept up in it. And uh, on the other hand, there was this compelling idea that all of these political prisoners could provide free labor to do all sorts of work that you couldn't pay anyone to do uh, because money is just not enough of a motivating force for the sorts of jobs that are likely to kill you, um, like, you know, felling trees in Siberia. So they imprisoned a, a big chunk of the population and sent them off to uh, work camps in various places, the Gulag Archipelago, and a lot of them died. Um, and uh, as a result of that, they uh, were able to start the industrialization that happened under Stalin and make the, make the country into an industrial powerhouse for a while. But the end result on society was absolutely devastating. So in the United States, the United States now has the highest per capita prison population in the world. And there are some similarities just in terms of locking people up. Um, there's this... Uh, idea that their whole communities of undesirables and so what you want to do is imprison their young people because you don't really want want that community to be viable so there's this attempt to undermine and um, there are a lot of uh, social problems that have been sort of not dealt with at all and, and so they're dealt with by locking people up there's a, a tradition of slavery that sort of went on um, even after the abolition, you know, where there were uh, chain gangs all over the place that, that basically treated people as slaves. Uh, they, they continue to this day. One example I've heard of is a brick factory in Atlanta that was basically staffed by uh, blacks who were worked to death, and this was after abolition. So there's this tendency to, to basically lock people up, work them to death, etc., deprive them of their freedom. But the whole thing is a money-losing venture in the United States. This is basically one of the runaway systems that will collapse under its own weight. Already California is releasing lots of inmates because there's no money for it. And um, another state that's doing it is Connecticut, which is a relatively prosperous state from a fiscal standpoint still. And so this is going to be the trend. More and more prison inmates are going to be released into the wild, as it were, and figure out how to survive. Um, during a time when there aren't any jobs for them. So this is a bad scenario overall, socially, I would say. I'm speaking with author and engineer Dmitry Orlov. Today's show, The Collapse Gap. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. And what about the comparison in terms of security between uh, the former Soviet Union and the United States today? Well, in Russia, the security situation became absolutely horrible. Uh, I remember one year I, I was going back there, and, and I would tell other Russians here you know, in the United States that I was going back there, and, and they would look at me in shock and, and tell me that I was insane because no sane person would go there because, you know, you could get shot. And, in fact, I know some people who did get shot. I didn't get shot. Um, for a while there, it took a, a, a certain kind of situational awareness bordering on outright paranoia to stay alive there like you would never uh, go anywhere at night unaccompanied for instance you, you had to have a security detachment follow you around wherever you went you couldn't just take a cab for instance by yourself because the cab driver might kill you and steal your luggage um, th those were probably like the, the worst the worst parts of it there was just absolute lawlessness and you know the police weren't getting paid so they, they basically turned to free enterprise you, you could hire a policeman for a day to look after you or a soldier for a while um, and and so that is sort of the environment when the official structures fall away uh, all sorts of nasty people from the shadows emerge and for a while there there's absolute mayhem and then you know, eventually it, it settles down and into various types of um, uh, community policing type initiatives and other efforts, and eventually things come together again. But there's a period when, especially big population centers and very remote areas, those are the least safe ones. Well, were people armed in the Soviet Union the way a lot of Americans are? Not in the same way. Uh, the weapons in Russia basically flowed from from the police and the military. Um, and, and so there were a lot of people who had 
service revolvers, for instance, or rifles that they had access to, and so they could use them in, I, I guess, a semi-official capacity. But the weapon of choice in Russia for a while was uh, the, the knife, Finka. Um, so a lot of people got stabbed, but not so many people got shot. But it's not, it's not that guns are what makes it possible to kill people. If you want to kill somebody, there's almost an infinite number of ways to do it. But guns desensitize people to the process. So they make it possible for somebody who can't kill a person with their bare hands to still kill a person. So that's a pernicious thing. You say that the U.S. now has over 1,000 military bases worldwide. What do you see as the future of these U.S. bases, and how does that compare to what happened to the Soviet military bases? Well, the Soviet Union uh, stationed troops in, in East Germany, uh, and when it came time to, to repatriate them, it turned out that you know there was uh, uh, nowhere to resettle them, especially officers' families that thought they would be there for the, for the duration of their careers. Um, there was no place to put the troops. There was all sorts of logistical problems with uh, getting the, the weapons and the ammunition and, and other war material back. A lot of it, a lot of it ended up abandoned or scrapped. And, and for the United States, the situation is, is much worse. These thousands of uh, military installations all around the planet, a lot of them don't actually serve any, any real purpose anymore. Um, you know, it's a well-known fact that the U.S. military can't actually win. They, they just perpetuate conflict. And so they do need to be scrapped. There is no money for them. Um, things would be quite a bit better, you know, financially speaking, in the United States if the defense budget was cut by two-thirds. Um, that's definitely something worth shooting for. But the problem is that it will take a lot of money to get all of this stuff back, to get everyone repatriated, to get all of the weapon system back and secure, etc., and, and uh, what will happen is, it'll happen anyway, but it will happen when lots of things have already fallen apart and the logistical nightmare of managing this transition is just unthinkably complex. So a lot of soldiers will be stranded in various foreign lands with no means to get back. A lot of weapon systems will simply be abandoned and probably fall into the wrong hands. And there will be a lack of transparency of visit or visibility to the whole process. It will just be murk for a while, and uh, bad things could happen as a result. What about the likelihood of our current judicial system giving way to martial law? You mentioned that briefly. What would be the cause of that? Well, right now it's a, a good system if you have a lot of money and a bad system if you don't. If you have to rely on public defenders, uh, it, you probably won't get a very good outcome. Part of that has to do with how lawyers are trained and how much debt they're saddled with in the process. So you, you can't really survive as a public defender very well. And so it's a very complicated system. It's a very expensive system. It results in these phenomenal rates of uh, imprisonment. And I think as it starts falling apart, all sorts of administrative measures will, will replace due process. I don't think that that is necessarily a good thing because due process is basically a, you know, a tissue of lies in, in a lot of cases anyway. But um, it, it's not a judicial system that the country can afford. It's too, it's too complicated and it doesn't work well enough and it's too complex to reform. So uh, a radical simplification where basically you, you make all decisions based on one magistrate and one clerk per district. Cases are brought before them and they decide them. In any case, it would be a lot cheaper. And you see this possibility, obviously, as a consequence of a, of a financial collapse. Well, yes, obvious. The finances stop working out, so the courthouse is closed. Courthouses cost a lot of money. Um, the court workers and the lawyers, there's no money for them either. They're, they're off growing potatoes somewhere. And then to maintain control, you maybe move in some National Guard people, you know, maybe federal emergency people. And then crimes get reported and somebody has to be punished for it. And somebody makes the decision as to how to do that. So criminal justice becomes rough and ready in those circumstances. It's inevitable. And, uh, as far as uh, the civil case load, that will basically dwindle to zero because why would you file a, you know, a civil claim if there is no chance of bringing it to court? So the litigious manner 
in which Americans do things will just run directly into this brick wall of, oh, well, you can't bring a case. So why would you even bother thinking about it? This doesn't sound all that far-fetched in view of what's currently happening here in California. Well, yes, I think California is way ahead of everyone else. Well, maybe not way ahead, but a little bit ahead. So we should all be studying California. You compare the Chernobyl disaster to the handling of the humanitarian disaster following Hurricane Katrina. What do you see as the similarities? Well, one of the similarities is, is um, both of them can be viewed as anthropogenic disasters. That is, you know, disasters that were perpetuated by, to some extent, human incompetence. In the case of the Chernobyl disaster, it was uh, political appointees running scientific experiments on a nuclear reactor, causing it to explode. In the case of uh, Hurricane Katrina, it was political appointees uh, running various public works having to do with construction of levees and, and management of canals, etc., that caused uh, you know, one of the most important and interesting cities in, in the United States to be virtually destroyed. And so that undermines the faith in authority at a lot of different levels where moving forward people just don't see experts as being experts. They see them as, as basically fairly craven people serving some political interest or other. And so that really undermined, in the, in the case of the Soviet Union, undermined faith in the establishment. And a lot of people started, even particularly scientists, started not believing the official numbers and compiling their own, which contradicted the official reports, started trying to figure out what's really going on by themselves. And when, you know, there were dramatic mismatches in, for instance, the levels of radiation reported, uh, then that, that went even further. And eventually the establishment lost enough legitimacy that, you know, basically people stopped trusting them altogether. Your point of view, because you've written this book, Reinventing Collapse, uh, and because of our uh, discussion today, you are of the opinion that the United States is going to follow the Soviet Union and the economy is going to collapse, correct? Uh, yes, yes. You say that Russia was able to bounce back because it remains fairly rich in oil and very rich in natural gas. How does Russia's situation in this regard compare to that of the United States? Well, the, the United States is um, much more pumped out than, than the Soviet Union was. Um, uh, Russian oil production in particular uh, peaked uh, a few years before the Soviet Union collapsed, and, and this was the, one of the things that made it, made it impossible for the Soviet Union to, to continue going on and taking on debt. Um, now, after that, they imported a lot of technology, and, and they, they managed things better, and, and so they came up with a second peak in production, which is happening as we speak. Uh, we, we might see another production increase, but uh, it seems rather unlikely because a lot of the provinces they have left are very expensive to develop. They're uh, uh, very far north and require a lot of very expensive advanced technology, so it may not be affordable to develop them. So in the United States, this is the country that once had more oil than Saudi Arabia, but but now it's like Swiss cheese. There are really uh, very few places left where it's worth trying to drill. And uh, the remaining oil is very expensive in terms of being able to get at it, and uh, the reservoirs are rather small. So there's really no chance that any scheme will, will allow the United States to plug up this, this gap in imports once the imports stop flowing. So the, the, only, the only solution there is to shut down most of the economy, probably more than half of it. And, and there's really no mechanism for doing that either. So when you say that Russia was able to bounce back, at least unevenly, in terms of society, what do you think is going to happen here in the United States if it's not able to come back out of this? Well, first of all, I, I don't think that, you know, uh, the United States, as, as a descriptive term, will describe anything in particular. Um, I think that, you know, it will be very different in, in, say, the Pacific Northwest than it will be in New England, than it will be in Texas. So these might as well 
be different countries moving forward. And there, I don't think that there's, I don't think that it's a very interesting label even now to, to talk about the country as a whole, because what it stands for now is a sort of fiction of the idea that things can continue the way they have. And if you admit that this is fiction, then you need better descriptive labels. You say that the United States could become an unrecognizable entity on the political map, and I guess this is what you've just described. Well, yes. I, I, I think that uh, we're pretty far away from the time when uh, Texans will require a visa to, to get into Oklahoma. But, but I, I think there will be reduced mobility, and I think regional uh, forces will, will take over from Washington. And uh, a lot of regions will try to forge their, their own way in the world because they will suddenly understand that what Washington has in mind is not to their benefit. Dmitry Orlov, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Great to be with you.